Wow, okay, well, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Basics. Um, I, have a, I have some video that I'm going to be uh, talking over and with, uh, so pardon me if I lag or if I get out of time. Um, hopefully, I, uh, I won't screw it up too bad. Um, I, mean, I am a bit nervous. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the first time in quite a few years I feel like I'm talking to an audience that's right for this sort of topic. So uh, here's hoping I don't blow it uh, by trying to sound smarter than I am. <laughs> okay, so uh, you can hit play. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that, quote, the more precisely the position is determined, the less precisely the momentum is known in this instant and vice versa. Werner Heisenberg wrote this in his uncertainty paper of 1927. This theory is very specific to the velocity, mass, and position of a quantum particle, and how when measuring one of those magnitudes, the other magnitudes mathematically blur. Heisenberg's matrix mechanics mathematics were abstract and unfamiliar when they began to appear to his colleagues, like Erwin Schrodinger, who, when to paraphrase, said that he felt discouraged by the methods of transcendental algebra and that they appeared difficult and lacked the visuality that his wave mechanics uh, concepts and equations had. But forget all that. This, uh, that was the past, and this event is about the future. So instead, we're going to talk about science fiction movies. <laughs> How about we start with Back to the Future, part two. <laughs> so, I, so this is one of those films that made a, a huge impact on my generation. It's a movie full of bad predictors, which I'm going to define as things that stand out as wrong as we approach the future in which the film takes place. Things that simply aren't going to happen. Back to the Future 2 was so energetic with its predictions that uh, the timeline seems a bit tight to make it to this by 2015. <laughs> when it came out in the, in the theaters in the fall of 1989, though, it caused all sorts of hype about flying cars, self-walking dogs, holograms. Uh, bartending robots and food dehydrators. Kids were convinced they were going to get a, uh, a hoverboard for Christmas that year. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it would also seem that rather than predicting the future, there was an ironic hint of early 20th century world spares. Uh, utopia, shown by the clothing and the way people act. But that kind of is a theme throughout the Back to the Future films. They did get a few things right, like this amazing flat screen monitor that can depict multiple television channels. <laughs> so that fax reference was probably the worst bad predictor in the film. <laughs> the real insight of this film comes as a throwaway gag early in the scenes in the form of a pair of self-lacing Nike shoes. Right. Shoes which Nike actually patented and on November 5th, 2009, uh, began making them, of which 1,500 were made <laughs> and on September 8th, 2011, were auctioned off to benefit the Michael J. Fox Foundation. These early versions didn't actually feature self-lacing, but it will be operable when they go into market to the general public in 2015, right on schedule. <laughs> So as Back to the Future 2 served to actually affect the future, so is my next film. I would like to talk about 2001, A Space Odyssey. But I'm not going to talk about 2001, A Space Odyssey. I'm going to talk about Minority Report, the 2002 Steven Spielberg film. Set in 2054, this is a noir action adventure film with plenty of excitement about the future and, of course, the film star, Tom Cruise. So, one of the particularly futury concepts is a visual glove-driven interface for exploring a video stream that Mr. Cruz uses to solve crime. Using a completely realistic combination of uh, conducting and um, synchronized swimming, maybe, uh, Cruz's character searches through uh, a series of vague moving images in order to find clues to a location in which a murder is going to take place. The science advisor to Minority Report, John Underkoffler, created this system for the film, and has now actually began ma uh, making this uh, technology a reality 30 years sooner than the film takes place. 
Here's a very recent uh, and very real promotional film for the G-Speak by Oblong Industries Incorporated. It's a pretty cool system if you have a lot of space to move around in and aren't easily embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the Magnum. <laughs> one of the really futuristic set pieces in my order. And one that will likely stand out over time as its bad trick. Spielberg hired a whole team of futurists several years before the making of Minority Report and had them drum up all sorts of great ideas to make this be as futuristic as possible. But one of the ideas that made it into film, the Magdalene, even Spielberg thought was a little ridiculous to be pushing it to 2054. Uh, the infrastructure change alone would render this a non-starter in our current politics. But that being said, minor with Minority Report, Spielberg did do his best to create as believable of a future as possible. So another film that holds scientific accuracy in high regard is 2001 A Space Odyssey. But I'm going to talk about its uh, unwanted predecessor, Mission to Mars. <laughs> the 2000 Brian De Palma film about a NASA rescue mission to the Red Planet that takes place in 2020. The film was supported by NASA with regards to the protocols and the ship design. There's this really wonderful anti-gravity ship that's on display in this fantastic Brian De Palma tracking shot. But the bad predictor in this film is that there is no chance of NASA going to Mars by 2020. Their most recent prediction of 2035 is looking pretty shaky. Since uh, retiring the space shuttle fleet in 2011, they've chosen to go with commercial ventures to support the International Space Station, like the recent success of SpaceX, whose Dragon spacecraft completed a successful mission just last month, uh, launching supplies to the International Space Station and then safely returning back to Earth. For humans, though, it would appear that one-way tickets are the way to go financially, but that seems a little bit un-American, spiritually. I have a little bit more to say, but uh, I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> so, if NASA's not going to be the one to uh, lead one-way missions to Mars, which no one will return from, who will? Well, uh, a Danish company actually is going to do this. Uh, they're called Mars One. Mars One will establish human settlement on Mars in 2023. In that year, the first group of four humans will land on Mars. Every two years after that, another group will join the settlement. That's also real, by the way. Um, so I would like to. Um, talk about NASA and how they poll their scientists to find realistic science fiction films. The past few years, the topper has been, anyone want to guess? 2001 maybe? No, no, it's Gattaca. <laughs> the 1997 film by Andrew Nichol about a future in which people are screened, then engineered from birth to be the best that they can be. And a man who was born naturally who tries to fake it. The science of this film concerns the regular screening procedures and how uh, the protagonist gets around them. For example, um, faking blood and urine samples and uh, leaving other um, interesting bits behind. He also calmly sands off his dead skin and follicles from his body daily, protecting his real identity and only letting his deception behind. But there is one minor flaw in this film, It's Bad Predictor, which breaks all pseudo-astronomers' hearts. Maybe it was a love of the planets. Maybe it was just my growing dislike for this one. But for as long as I can remember, I have dreamed of going into space. 700 million, 750 million, 800 million, 850 million. How many astronauts are there anyway? I bet I could be one if I wanted. Hey, don't eat that. It's Pluto. <laughs> so I would like to wrap up with some scenes from Fritz Lang's Metropolis the German science fiction film made in 1927. This is a, an expressionist silent film about an advanced industrial society that predicted a near permanent rift between the wealthy thinkers and planners and the uh, working class, which they had completely lost connection to. A, a pretty good predict. So uh, the film also predicted video calling years before televisions even existed. 
So, Metropolis was this hugely budgeted film for the time, and it took nearly three years to produce. It was filmed over more than a full year in 1926 Berlin, 350 miles to the east of the town of Göttingen, Germany, where Werner Heisenberg was working creating matrix mathematics to describe particle motion, his big step in his work on quantum physics, for which he received the Nobel Prize in 1932. You see, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, for which he's most culturally famous, is often confused with the observer effect. The observer effect refers to the influence an observer has over a system, and how simply looking at something will affect its outcome, like a science fiction film that tries to predict the future and in a way influences it. Science fiction films, uh, in their attempts to create exciting and believable futures, make interesting and exciting artistic choices, some of which pay off, and others which don't. Which brings us finally to... <laughs> A film that caused uh, me a whole lot of grief while trying to prepare this presentation. Partly because, other than the date in which the film takes place, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick managed to create uh, an entirely believable world that still seems very tied to what could become of our future. Like Schrodinger's response to Heisenberg's mathematics as abstract and visually lacking, 2001 isn't as easy to digest as some uh, other more popular science fiction films that have come and gone. But it sure has had lasting power. A moot complaint by Schrodinger anyway, uh, Heisenberg called his theory crap too, and in the end they both ended up being folded into quantum mechanics in 1927. 2001 is slow, and some say that it's boring. When it was first released in 1968, Stanley Kaufman of the New Republic called it a film that is so dull it even dulls our interest in the technical ingenuity. And Andrew Sarris called it one of the grimmest films I have ever seen in my life. But that doesn't have any effect on our still current perceived futuristic accuracy that it has. Of course space will be a commercial venture. Of course there will be televisions on the back of the seat in front of you on an airplane. Of course we will eat rudimentary paste while we stare at our tablet computers for, uh, for breakfast. <laughs> I did that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, the most astute of these predictions is that uh, computer processing and memory is depicted in the film as vague, clear objects. Kubrick didn't risk uh, guessing what processing power was going to look like. He went with something that was going to be kind of vague and believable. He didn't risk guessing the technology. What makes 2001 a bad predictor is that it wasn't trying to predict anything. It was showing instead what in 1968 will be. There's just no question of this future. There's no question that science fiction films, good and bad, will continue to get made. There's no question there'll be more bad predictors. There is no question about it. <laughs> Thank you.